Hey everyone, it's Chris. Um, happy Monday. I hope everyone is having an amazing start to the week. I'm coming today to film an unboxing. Um, it's an exciting unboxing for me because I've been sent uh, a lovely gift from our lovely Richard uh, from Long Man Taro. Um, so not quite fitting this into the camera shop. Never mind, we're going to turn the camera around um, and I'm going to let you see me going through um, all of the nice things that you sent me. Um, so yeah, thank you to thank you so so much to Richard for sending this. Um, I will put a link to Richard's channel. It's Long Man Taro in the description if you could go over and give him a wee sub. So anyway, let's turn the camera around and let's have a wee have a wee nosy in the box. Okay guys, so this is the box that Richard has sent me, um, let's have a nosy inside, um, so I'm going to do my best to keep addresses and whatnot covered up, um, he sent a really kind note that I'll read later on, um, let's see what have we got in here, so you can see right away that he sent me the, the Byzantine Tarot by Silla Conway and John Matthews. Um, so this is a deck that I had mentioned in a live chat that I've been kind of looking at and interested in getting. Um, so Richard's um, been the kind soul that he has, it's picked up on that um, and has, it, he had a copy that he wasn't using so he's, he's kindly sent me it. Um, so I'll put that to one side for now because let's we'll, we'll, we'll go through the cards, we'll do like a wee unboxing. Um, but let's have a look and see what goodies are in here. Okay, so we've got some lovely wax melts here. They smell amazing. It's, it's that kind of... Uh, I'm not really sure how to describe it. I'm not very good at describing smells. It's like a butterscotchy... Um, you know, it's like one of those candles. It's, it's beautiful. Um, and he's also... Uh, sent a lovely hagstone um, that he's picked up at his local beach um, so it's got a hole through it so I'll be able to, if I want to I'll be able to kind of attach it to something if I, if I so wish but this feels lovely it feels really smooth you know as a hagstone does um, so yeah thank you so much Richard that was really really kind of you um, whoops that was loud Okay, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to sit down in my chair, um, the squeakiest chair in the world, and let's have a wee nosy at this. Um, so I believe this is the first edition of the uh, Byzantine Tarot. Um, so it comes in this kind of two-part box. Um, it's got... So it's got an awesome book that comes with it, you know, there's so much detail. Um you know, included for each card. Um, so for the majors, we get two pages per card, it looks like. Uh, for the minors, we get a page per card, so as you can see there. Okay. And our four suits are swords, staffs, cups, and coins. Okay. Um, the book also has some information on different spreads as well. Um, meditate, some information on meditating with the cards. Um, oh, it's even got a sample reading actually. So I'm going to, I'm going to really enjoy kind of reading this. What we might do is, as we're looking at the cards, we might kind of refer back to the book, um, just to you know, if we, if we want to kind of get a, a broader understanding of maybe why they've they've chosen. Uh, particular names for particular cards and whatnot. So this is the deck. Um, let's do a comparison now. Let me find a deck that I can compare it to. So if I get this, so I'll compare it to the Zany Tarot, um, which is. It's a make playing cards deck. The size is um kind of your standard tarot size, your standard US games tarot size, I believe, and that you know it has a kind of standard thickness as well. Um, so if you compare it, the Byzantine tarot is 
you know, it's a, it's a lot thicker. So it is, uh, if you can see that. So that's thicker by, you know, several cards. Um, you know, a good quarter of the deck. Um, in terms of comparing the size, you know, taller and broader. Okay, so quite big cards. It has this gloss to it, so it does. I don't mind glossy cards if I'm totally honest with you, it doesn't bother me. Um, so let's see if we can get this to zoom in, but not zoom in too much. So if I do that, there we go. That way we have a perfect view of the cards. Okay, so we start off and we've got the Holy Fool. And we can see that the, the figure is naked here, which is, a, you know, a symbol of innocence. And that's, you know, a big thing about the Fool is he, he has this innocence about him. He has no regard or, or really kind of no awareness of the kind of social norms, you know. It's kind of like Adam and Eve before they eat the apple and realise that they're naked. The Magus. Quite traditional imagery for the Magus here. You know, we see that he's holding, I believe he's holding the wand and we see that, in fact, no, so we've got a table with the cup, the coin, the wand and the sword on it. And then the Magus is standing inside what appears to be like a sacred circle that he's cast. Now we have Sophia um, as our high priestess here. So let's have a look at the book. Um, just do this, try and do it so as you can see. So Sophia, the wisdom of God, sits on a throne of gold in a typically uh, high erratic, path, erratic position, excuse me, with arms upraised in blessing. Behind her there is suggestion of wings and her head is adorned with a halo signifying her spiritual importance okay so i won't read the entire excerpt from what you know the the meaning of sophia but if we look at what um what it says for in a reading the central quality of the female pope or high priestess in tarot is wisdom so there can be a few appropriate archetypes that uh, than that of sophia uh, to f sorry let's try that again so there can be f few more appropriate archetypes than that of Sophia to fulfil this role. She works primarily through the use of symbolism and mystery, imparting her feminine wis wisdom through oracle and vision. Sophia may represent your own inner leanings towards mysticism, or a friend or ally who guides you into recognition of the mysteries in your own life. She's compassionate and protective both of individuals and of the cosmos itself. These microscopic, sorry, microcosmic and macrocosmic links represent our own abilities to see the small and seemingly insignificant details within a situation and the setting of that situation in a larger frame. In her reversed aspect, she may represent the problems and blockages that plague you on your journey or make access to your inner life difficult. And then we have these keywords here as well. The tessery. So that's to give you an idea of what it says about, um, you know, about the cards and the book, what kind of information that we're given because um, I feel that's helpful to know um, and Sophia means the wisdom of God we've learned that as well the third card is our Empress and we really get this kind of you know this richness from the Empress here we've got our Emperor Okay, so instead of the Hierophant, we've got Patriarch. So 
you see actually here I'm just happened to glance at the backs of the cards there as I was turning them over um, so if you look at the border around the backs of the cards it's not like they're not all the same they're not consistent we have you know the shades of between brown and gold or bronze and gold they kind of uh, move throughout the deck so here we can see like the top is like this kind of dark brown bronze color Whereas here we've kind of we're turning to, to gold and the, the kind of darker colour we move to the bottom. So that's that's quite cool. I like that. Your lovers. And we see Adam and Eve. Eve's given the Adam the the apple or you know whatever the fruit is. And we see the snake. Um and the tree of knowledge behind them. The charioteer. Quite traditional image here for the chariot. You know, the black horse and the white horse. So in this deck, Justice is number eight. And we see the figure, the angel holding the sword and the scales. Again, quite traditional. It looks to me as though the the angel is flying here rather than, um, you know, feet firmly on the ground. The hermit. The wheel. Fortitude. Which is as we've got, you know, the man wrestling with God. The hanged man. Death. This is quite interesting. We, we appear to have the figure lying in bed. You know, who's, you know, that appears to be the deathbed. And then this is, is this their soul that's coming out um, and moving towards our kind of death figure here that we see cloaked in black. Temperance. We have Diabolos or Diablos. So we almost have this Gorgon figure with the, the snakes for the hair. The tower. The tower is really interesting. So we've got this kind of snakes and ladders feel and then we seem to have this person up on a lectern reading from, is it, you know, a holy book that they're reading from? In fact, let's have a really look and see what the book says about this image because that's really interesting. So the book says, A hooded figure sits at the top of a huge stone column holding a sacred book in his hands while around the pillar twines the form of a huge serpent threatening either to pull it down or break it in two. Above the figure, rays of lightning descend around the pillar. So there you go, that's interesting. I love the snakes and ladders feel. The star. 
I'm happy to see the, the Star of Bethlehem here. The moon. Sun. Judgment. Oh, wow. So we've got the, the ladder here and we've got all the people kind of climbing the ladder, going towards what appears to be God. But then if you look, we've got these kind of demons pulling them down. So is this like heaven and this is hell? So is the ladder supposed to represent us on our journey through life? And these are the forces that try and, you know, try and lead us off track, almost. And then instead of the world, we've got Cosmos. I'm interested in what we're looking at here, so let's have a look. So it's quite traditional in that, you know, we have the, the you know, the four uh, figures in the corners. But that is not the world dancer. So this is meant to be Christ. The figure of Christ sits in triumph at the centre of a man, uh, mandorla, surrounded by the four cherubim holding the symbols of the minor arcana, the staff, the coin, the cup and the sword, together the symbols of the Byzantine tarot. So we see Christ and the Cosmos card. So those are the majors. Um, let's have a look at the minor arcana cards then. So what I'm going to do actually, because I'm funny about the way the suits are, um, I'm just going to reorder them to the way that I'm used to. Because why not? And then let's make sure that we've still got that in the center. Oh my god, looking good. So the Ace of Staffs, Staffs being the Wands, Got the Two of Staffs, so the person, the figure appears to be reaching for something that's off the side that, that we can't see, the Three of Staffs. An interesting image, it's certainly not what we're used to for like a standard three of fire, three of wands. The four of staffs. Five staffs. The six, this looks a bit more what we're used to, you know, that's kind of victory march. Seven. The eight. It's 
So this person looks like a teacher who's teaching them how to fire the arrow. The nine. It's really kind of defensive here. And the ten of staffs, again quite traditional. Page of staffs. So we really get this messenger feel. The Knight of Staffs. Very kind of Apollo. The music. And we have the Countess of Staffs rather than a Queen of Staffs. She appears to be holding a feather quill. And this is that bit get free. And the count. So countess and count rather than king and queen. Or queen and king, rather. So then we move on to swords, and it's interesting that we appear to have the element of fire depicted in the swords, so is this a deck that switches the elements round? So it does appear to be in the air here, you know, we've got the bird. So, yeah, I, I've not looked it up in the book. Um, I wonder if we can find it quickly to see what it says. So, swords of power, which represent, okay, so, so it says here, when choosing the emblems of the four suits of the Byzantine tarot, we looked for images that represented both the classical tarot and the world of the Byzantine court, which is so important to an understanding of the culture. We decided to go for objects that were both familiar and representative, hence we have swords of power, which represent the army, Staffs of office, uh, the elaborate rods carried by court officials throughout the Byzantine world. Cups of state, representing the spiritual and artistic aspects of the court. And coins of empire, representing trade and commerce. Just very quickly glancing down to see if there's any mention of elemental associations. Yeah, so swords of power or fire here. Yeah. So the, so the suit of swords is primarily about struggle, strife and working towards growth and change. There was no shortage of this in the Byzantine world and, oh, sorry, the, the intricate struggles and betrayals of which are still used to refer to internus and strife. Wow, really challenging me today, aren't we? Thus, throughout the suit, we see uh, the individual fighting against seemingly inseparable odds with the hope of victory or triumph very much present. The energy of the swords pierces the outer shell of life and allows light to enter. The blades cut away the things we no longer need, leaving us lighter and, and better able to proceed on our journey. The result is transformation. The restoration of the reader's circumstances at many levels. So swords are associated to fire, staffs are associated to air, and cups are water and coins of the earth. So we've got the ace of swords, two of swords. I mean although it is you know, we're looking at the element of fire. This looks more like this looks just like a two of swords as opposed to having 
you know, two of air, or two, two of fire feels, two of wand feels, you know. You know, we've got someone who appears to be struggling to make a decision. You know, the, the represented by the crossed swords. Three of swords here. So this does, you know, if you think about the traditional three of wands, three of fire, you know, you could go there with this card. I wonder how it compares to the... Three of staffs. I mean, really, for me, the three of staffs looks looks very kind of three of coins, three of pentacles. But I'm I'm at a danger of going off on a tangent here, so. Um, so yeah, let's let's take the majors away. I'm what I'm going to actually do is just keep things the suits separated, so that if I want to compare. Um, then I can. So we get the Four of Swords again. Feels like a normal Four of Swords to me. You know, we've got this idea of taking a break from the action, taking some rest, taking some time to stabilize. You know, the um, well, the mind usually you would say, but. Five of Swords again, it looks like defeat to me, it looks very Five of Swords. The Six. The Seven of Swords. See, so yeah, it's interesting, you've got this kind of battle happening, ship to ship, and there's like the kind of cannon fire. The Eight of Swords. And this person is kind of trapped, almost looks like they're mummified, wrapped in bandages. But they, you know, they hold, they're holding the end of the, of the bandage so that, you know, the, they have the capacity to set themselves free. And what do we make of all of the people watching on though? The Nine of Swords, quite standard Nine of Swords to me, you know, this idea of, well, at least from a, a, a Smith weight perspective, um, you know, a lot of kind of, a lot on your mind, a lot happening up in your head. Things like stress and anxiety. Ten of Swords, you know. We've got the person lying dead on the ground. We have the you know the the people riding away on horses with you know blood stained swords. Page of swords. Knight of Swords. This reminds me of the Six of Wands from the Mariel Tarot. Just this kind of, and that and that um that image we see one of the archangels, um slaying a demon, and this kind of just reminds me of that. The Countess of Swords. I almost feel that sadness coming from her. And the Count of Swords. Quite a stern looking man, isn't he? So that's the Swords. We then come on to the Suit of Cups. So the Ace of Cups, which is the Holy Grail, I believe. The 
two of cups. You see the kind of the doves and the couple exchanging drinks. The three, you know, the, the, the jovial, the party, um, just kind of good friends getting together and spending time together. The four, if we look at her, we really kind of, we can, we can get that dissatisfaction from her. Let me actually turn on another light. I'm not going to be too old anymore. Five of Cups. The Six of Cups. So one side of the pond we have the, you know, what looks to be a, some kids riding on a camel. On the other side we have the kids playing. I don't really know what to make of this card actually. Seven of Cups. Look at all the different types of cups that we have. The Eight. You know, leaving things behind to go on in search of what you're missing. There's something missing, you can't quite put your finger on it. So you're going on a quest to find that. Guided by moonlight. The Nine of Cups. This really joyful energy from this card. And the Ten. The couple with the newborn baby. We see the rainbow here. Again, we see all different kinds of cups here behind them. The page. So he's really kind of protecting what's in the cup, really protecting those emotions, you know. The night. Queen of Cups. So the, the sorry, the Countess of Cups rather. And the Count of Cups. And the, the boat behind them with the ladder coming from it. It's interesting. I love the colours that he's wearing, these blues and greens are quite vibrant. And last but not least we have the suit of coins. Making an absolute mess here. Thankfully you guys can't see it. Don't know why I felt the need to mess with that there because it was fine the way it was. So that was the Ace of Coins, the Two of Coins, the Three of Coins, the Four. Collecting up all the coins, all the piles of coins, and putting them in a chest. The five. It's interesting. So I can just show you. Each of the coins depicts something different on them. So 
was that the kind of story to show how they got to where they are. So we're going to see. Looks as though we see them getting married. And this coin here. This looks. It looks like him harvesting something. What maybe just working in his youth. Not sure what we're seeing here. Yeah, I'll maybe need to have a proper look at that, but that's quite interesting, the fact that we see that. The six of coins. The seven. So he's sitting in contemplation, he's waiting for the right time to harvest. But in all his contemplations, is he you know, is he missing something that's happening here? You can see he's not focusing on his work, he's focusing elsewhere. Eight of coins. The nine. And the ten. So you get this really like, um, they don't look happy if you look at the kind of older gentleman. And the you know what appears to be a female figure here. She's you know she's not happy at all. She looks quite cross. The kid looks quite confused as though what's happening. Why are you taking me away? And he's just on a mission, you know. You see the dog. It looks to me as though like these are maybe. The parents of one of these two, so like the grandparents, and they've they've decided they're kind of going to branch off on their own. You know, they want to make their own life and achieve their own goals and stuff. So they don't want to depend on these two anymore. But the, it's not. It doesn't look like an amicable situation. You know, it's not a kind of wishing you well. You know, off you go into the world. Like no one looks happy about what's happening. page of coins holding on treasure in his coin the knight of coins the countess Adorned in these beautiful clothes. We look at her cape, all the kind of embellishments and whatnot. She appears to be sitting in the garden. And then we have the Count of Coins. And he's very much focused on his coin. That is what matters. So I've just realised guys that I'd ended the video before I actually did my usual interview spread with the deck and um, so I've been shuffling it and I'm going to do that now. I'll try and edit out the bit where I've said like bye and all that kind of thing um, but you know that might not happen so um, yeah we'll, we'll see we'll see how my editing skills are. Um, so yeah, I've been giving this a good shuffle. It's quite a pliable deck, um, so it's quite easy to ruffle shuffle, but it does mean that it does kind of retain a bit of a bow, a bit of a bend. Um, so if you don't like your cards to be bent or bowed, then it's probably not one to ruffle shuffle, but it, I mean, it's fine just now, you know, you can just kind of straighten it out, but it will over time, I would imagine, develop it. We continue ruffling, it'll develop a, a bit of a bow. Um, so yeah, let's have a look um, and do an interview with the deck. 
Um, so the first card is where the deck tells us about itself, and we've got the Four of Swords. Um, so this is maybe a bit of a, you know, a rest from the hustle and the bustle of everyday life, of everyday readings, and just a kind of a calm and quiet deck to quiet your mind and, and just kind of chill out a bit and think about, you know, just maybe things that aren't as serious, that don't require as much, you know, tax and brain energy. Um, and it's just going to like give you like a bit of a rest, you know. Um, strengths of the deck, why do I keep turning them like that? Uh, the Ten of Coins. Um, so, like making it clear when you need to walk away from a situation. Um, we've just been talking about what I saw in the Ten of Coins and I really do see this as a kind of separation, you know, a kind of breaking off. Um, tens for me are about kind of renewal of the cycle, you know. Um, so it looks as though this, the kind of younger um, part of the family are, are branching off on their own. They're a, they're a way to find their own ace of coins and start from scratch again. Um, so maybe a strength is helping you to find, you know, new potential in your life that can let you kind of build something new. A weakness of the deck is the next card. Uh, and let's see, we've got the Knight of Swords. Knight of Swords for me is quite pure and simple, the, the kind of, the detailed analysis, um, it's kind of a, a bit of a keyboard warrior card, I think, sometimes, um, the Knight of Swords, um, is a good soul at heart, you know, they, they, they interact with the world by questioning things, um, and if they see an issue, they're not scared to raise it, um, quite often they can come across as maybe being a bit abrasive um, and quite challenging, quite a challenging person. But I think what we have to remember about the Knight of Swords is just as much as they challenge other people as we might find them challenging, they also turn that that heated perception back on themselves. Um, we see uh, the you know the, the knight here is, is slain some sort of demon. Um, so although it's ident the, the deck might be good at identifying, you know, avenues for new potential, new growth, it's perhaps not a shadow work deck. Um, what are you here to teach me is the, the fourth card, uh, and we have fortitude. So just how to be proud of yourself, how to, you know, not be ashamed, um, how to stand up for what you believe in. Uh, am I getting the card in okay? Let's just do that. So is that enough for a fact that it's, that it's there? So yeah, fortitude. How to have confidence, really. Um, how can I best work um, with the deck? We've got the fool. So just abandon all preconceptions of what's, you know, socially acceptable norms, all that kind of thing. The fool is very much about wiping the slate clean and really kind of going off on a journey um you know as if you you know it's, it's kind of adopting the beginner mindset and just being confident about diving in and not being worried about you know oh but this goes against the grain you know that's the fool's point it does go against the grain because as far as he's concerned there is no grain to go against and that's kind of you know that's that's the beauty and the and the beast in the fool. Um, and then the last one is the outcome of our working relationship together. And we've got the hermit there. Um, so the hermit's actually my card of the day. For today that I've pulled. Um, so the hermit is this kind of being able to go within. Or just being able to take some time aside from society. Aside from, um, you know, distance yourself a bit from the hustle and the bustle of everything. Um, just to, whether it's to discover new things about yourself or discover new things in general that you can then take back to the group and everyone can benefit from. Okay, so that, there we go. That's a wee interview spread with the Byzantine Tarot. Um, thank you again so much to Richard um, from Longman Tarot for gifting me this. It was so, so kind of you. Um, really thoughtful gift. Um, I will link Richard's channel in the description if everybody could go and give him a sub. That would be amazing. Um, yeah, that just leaves me to say take care everyone. I hope that you have an amazing week and I shall hopefully speak to you all soon. Bye bye.